This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And, yes, a remarkable new film is now in theaters that chronicles one of the greatest civil rights leaders in this country's history. It's called Dolores. Yes, our guest, Dolores Huerta, the legendary co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association, which went on to become the United Farm Workers of America. This is the trailer. After I had seen the miserable conditions of farm workers, Cesar Chavez said, we have to organize a union. So you had this ambience all around you that you could really change the world. It's beyond question the largest gathering on behalf of farm workers in California history. I wish they'd all go back to where they came from. We had no labor troubles. She wasn't asking for permission. She just did what needed to be done. She has such a firm belief in what she's doing We've never given up. that she infects you with it. Dolores Huerta. 90,000 people were poisoned in the fields of the United States of America. The farm workers founded the whole idea of environmental justice. That's a clip from the new documentary, Dolores, which opens in theaters on September 1st. We're joined in studio by Dolores Huerta, legendary civil rights activist, co-founder of the United Farm Workers of America, president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation for Community Organizing. It is wonderful to have you in our studio. We've interviewed many times around the country, but you've never graced us here at Democracy Now!, so it's so great to have you with us, Dolores. Um, Talk about how you came to organize the United Farm Workers. Well, I was very blessed uh, in meeting this great human being named Fred Roth Sr., uh, who actually uh, recruited Caesar and myself in house meetings. You're talking about Caesar Chavez. Caesar Chavez, and the, and uh, I, 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 he ta he told us how we could really change the world. And Fred's name is Fred Roth Sr. And uh, we belong to another organization called the Community Service Organization. And when we tried to get that organization to support a union of farm workers, they refused. <laughs> and so then Cesar and I went off, and we left that organization and, and, be, and uh, began the United Farm Workers. How did you meet Cesar Chavez? Uh, in that organization, the Community Service Organization. Cesar was organizing in San Jose. Uh, I was organizing in Stockton. And the one thing that we did have in common was the whole plight of farm workers. And so uh, then uh, we made a plan plan on how we could organize a, a farm workers union, but the community service organization uh, did not support us on that plan. So we both left uh, uh, the CSO and started the, un the United Farm Workers. Um, I want to take a step back. A lot is known about Dr. Martin Luther King, about mm -hmm. Cesar Chavez. Mm -hmm. Not as much about you, although, of course, that the people you've worked with over the years, the number of the millions of people you've affected. And so I want to go back to where you were born and how you came to do what you do. Well, I was born in the state of New Mexico and uh, moved to Stockton uh, when I was uh, six years old. Uh, my parents divorced, and my mother took us to Stockton, and, and that's where I was raised, and that's where uh, I started my initial uh, organizing in that area. And how did you, as a teenager, decide that organizing was going to be the path of your life, and specifically working with farm workers? Well, uh, that was kind of accidental. Uh, where I grew up, Stockton, California, is an agricultural community. And as a youngster, I was a Girl Scout for 10 years of my life, and I was in a lot of different social clubs. But when I met Mr. Ross, and he showed us that what we could actually do by coming together and organizing and taking direct nonviolent action, then I was really, I thought, oh my goodness, this is what I want to do uh, with my life. And so I became a school teacher, then I left teaching uh, to go to Delano to start the union there. And farm workers themselves, um, the great boycott that you helped to lead, the workers' strikes, talk about how you organized them. What was the strategy? And then talk about your response to the impact that it had. Well, the, the thing is that uh, when people think about the strike, and uh, it's very dramatic, uh, colorful, but what they don't see is, like, the three years before the strike, where we organized workers in house meetings. And this is a method that Fred Ross taught us, by meeting people's homes, uh, you know, one family at a time, and then bringing them all together. And this is the same kind of a method that we use today with my foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, where we're working on ending the school-to-prison pipeline, uh, working on environmental issues, on economic issues and, uh, you know, inspiring people that they — and motivating them that they have power, but that they can make the changes, but that they have to make the changes. No one can do it for them. And uh, this is the kind of work that we do, using that same organizing method 
one family at a time, one family at a time. And it's very tedious and it's very time consuming, but then the results are really wonderful. Uh, we recently uh, settled a lawsuit with our current high school district in California, in Bakersfield, uh, for the expulsion and suspension of African American and Latino students. And uh, now they have to change their policies and they have to change their procedures uh, to keep the students in school. And so we'll go out there and we organize the parents. And then the parents are the ones that take on uh, the, they become the leaders of making sure that some of these uh, policies are changed. When was the great boycott? It was uh, in 1968. We started the boycott in 1968. Mm -hmm. And explain what it was. What was the strategy you took? Well, the strategy was that we had farm workers come out from California and, again, using those same methods of meeting people in their homes and organizing groups uh, throughout the United States and uh, asking people to come and support. Number one, to get people to pick at the stores and ask people not to buy grapes. And at the end of the day, we had like 17 million people that were not eating grapes. And this is what brought the growers to the bargaining table. What about Robert Kennedy's role? How well, significant was it? And how did uh, you and Cesar Chavez um, reach out to him? Well, um, Senator Kennedy uh, had been a supporter. Uh, early on, uh, he uh, came to California. He had a hearing right in the middle of the, of the strike, and there's a very dramatic moment in, in the in the movie Dolores, uh, where uh, Robert Kennedy tells the sheriff uh, of Kern County and, and the district attorney uh, to read the Constitution of the United States because they were continu continuously arresting us, uh, so that we wouldn't be allowed, you know, we wouldn't be able to pick it. And uh, so he was a great supporter. And then, of course, uh, uh, we uh, helped him very much in his campaign when he was running for the presidency by going out there and getting people out to vote. When you hear about corporations suing activists, mm -hmm. um, for example, you have energy transfer partners suing Greenpeace and other groups calling them eco-terrorists, mm -hmm. do you identify with the organizers, the people who are under attack? And did you experience anything like this over the years in your organizing? Well, yes, yes, we did, uh, but we also, you know, sued them, you know, for one of the suits, uh, suits that we filed against the Farm Bureau Federation uh, and the Teamsters Union. Uh, it, w it was the the, uh, the coming together. They're, they're coming together uh, to come and to uh, come and to take away the uh, contracts of the United Farm Workers. And I think that this new tactic that they're having now, uh, we know that we have friends of ours that uh, were able to end fracking in Monterey County, and then Chevron is turning around and suing them and trying to stop. Are trying to stop them uh, from ending the fracking. So I think this is a new tactic that obviously uh, the oil companies and the en are going to energy companies are, are using uh, to just uh, try to stop the progress of the environmental organizations. Can you talk about workers' strikes in the 1960s that you helped to lead? Well, again, the strikes uh, took place after many, many years of organizing people at the grassroots level and to prepare them and, uh, you know, to let them know that they have the power to make the changes. And if they don't make the changes, that those changes are not, not going to be made. And uh, I think, and I think in terms of today, and this is what why we hope that people will see the film, because, uh, again, this is a message that we want to get out there. We know we have a lot of obstacles right now, uh, but the only way that we're going to be able to overcome those obstacles is by everybody. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I do want to say one thing. I think it's wonderful and it's great that we have, like, 40,000 people protesting in Boston against the all right and the, you know, the neo-Nazis, and we have all of these marches, uh, like the Women's March and the other marches that have taken place. But we've got to march to the polls. We've got to march uh, to the ballot box, because if people do not vote, then we really can't change the policies. And we know that many of the things that we fought for in the 60s and 70s in the 80s, you know, are not being rolled back. And the only way that we can stop this is by really electing progressive people to all of our uh, different public offices at the local level and especially at the national level. I wanted to turn to a clip of your film, Dolores. Si sí se puede! For Cesar, si sí se puede wasn't just a slogan. When people in Arizona said, they told me, no, Dolores, no se puede. You can't do this in Arizona, uh, only in California. My response to them was, si se puede. Si se puede, si se puede. Hers was the rallying cry that would later come to define the presidential campaign of candidate Barack Obama. Yes, we can. Have you heard President Obama say, yes, we can? It came from Cesar Chavez, si se puede. 
Dolores Huerta came up with the slogan, Si se puede, and we all attribute that uh, to uh, Cesar Chavez, even Barack Obama. Of course, when he gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he had to correct himself. <laughs> On a personal note, uh, Dolores was uh, very gracious uh, when I told her I had stolen her slogan, uh, Si se puede, yes we can. Uh, knowing her, uh, uh, I'm pleased that she let me off easy, because uh, Dolores does not play. That was a clip from the documentary Dolores. So, si se puede was your phrase. Mm -hmm. Yes. When did you come up with it? In Arizona, actually, in 1972. Uh, when Caesar was fasting, he was doing a 25-day water-only fast, uh, kind of to, to, to take the, the hatred out of the hearts of the growers, that's the way that he put it. And uh, so we were trying to organize people to come and to join us. And speaking to a group of professional Latinos, asking them to come and join us, and they said, no, you can't do this in Arizona, only in California. No se puede. No, you can't. And my response to them was, yes, we can. Si se puede. Uh, in Arizona, the way that we, we, you know, the way we organize in California. I wanted to turn to another clip mm -hmm. of the film that's mm -hmm. now out in theaters around the country. This is Dolores, and the clip begins with the feminist icon Gloria Steinem. I didn't really know Dolores before New York, but I think I was scared of her. <laughs> I don't think that Dolores thought I was worth the trouble until I got Huntington Hartford to pick at the A&P, which, of course, got press because the heir to the A&P fortune was boycotting the A&P. After that, we became partners. My mother was raised a Catholic and very traditional and prior uh, to going to New York City. She really didn't speak of feminism. I was in New York when the feminist movement was being born, but my mind was focused on getting all of those women at those conventions to support the farm workers. There was a time when rarely could you discover women of color who would identify as feminists, because it was assumed to be a question simply of gender. And if it was a question simply of gender, that gender was white. When social justice movements arise in a patriarchal system, all kinds of false divisions are made. So that was Angela Davis and Gloria Steinem uh, talking about Dolores. That's Dolores Huerta and the new film about her. That's a clip. You are often seen in photographs with oh, all your male colleagues. Can you talk about um, when you came to see the importance of the intersectionality of the labor movement, the women's movement, people of color, and the feminist movement? Well, in order to be able to win uh, to, uh, through the boycott, uh, to begin with, we had to reach out to all of the different organizations, and uh, otherwise we couldn't win. I mean, the 17 million Americans that, that stopped eating grapes, uh, you know, included all of these different organizations. And so, and I think that's uh, one of the messages that we have today, is that, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to, again, counter the Trump administration is that we've all got to work together. You know, we've all got to work on the environmental issues. We've, we've all got to support labor unions. Uh, We've got to support the immigrant rights movement, et cetera, and, and the LGBT movement also, because we can't be in our silos and win. We've all got to work together. I think that's the lesson that we have from uh, the boycott. When you first came to know Gloria Steinem, your views on choice and abortion uh, separated you both. Can you talk about uh, how you took this on? Well, I think uh, Gloria helped me a lot, as did Ellie Smeal from the Feminist Majority, in terms of— uh, You were originally anti-abortion. Oh, very much, yes, because I was a Catholic, and that's the way that I had been taught and trained, like many Latina women out there. You know, even, I think, when we think of Latina women that may have voted for Trump, that was probably the issue that they did. And, you know, they haven't really come to the realization, as I did, that, you know, a woman, the only way that you can control your life is to control your body in the first place, and that that's got to be uh, a choice of women and make, and you have to respect somebody else's choice in terms of how many children they want to have or not to have. I like to say that my daughter Juanita likes to have dogs and not children, you know, and that's her choice. And we've got to respect that choice. And, and women, yes, they do need to have the right uh, to have an abortion if they need so. And I know that that's one of the issues that the conservatives and the Republicans really focus on. But they really use that, uh, uh, that issue to subjugate women. 
And uh, we know that we've got to have more feminists on all of these public boards. I like to say, if you don't have women on those boards, they're going to make the wrong decision. Dolores Huerta, you mentioned your daughter, Juanita. How many kids do you have? I have 11. You have 11 kids. How, how did you have all these kids and do the organizing that you did? Well, I had to ask for people to help me uh, with my children, and, you know, I dragged them around the country with me, and but they all grew up very resourceful, very strong, and uh, they survived. Uh, you know, I think a really poignant part of the film um, was um, your children talking about what it was like to grow up with you mm -hmm. and without you. Mm -hmm. And it was a very honest look, you know, great deal of love, um, and also I wouldn't say resentment. I would say an honest expression of their pain at not being able to spend the kind of time they wanted with you as they grew up. What was it like on your end of things? Well, it, uh, I knew that uh, when I was leaving my children behind or, or I was, when I was bringing them with me, say, for instance, bringing them to New York City here for the boycott, that uh, it, it was always a painful experience. But the but on the other hand, you know, they kind of grew up in the movement, uh, so they became very independent, they became very resourceful. and. Uh, uh, and also, they realized that uh, they had to kind of uh, fend for themselves in some respects, you know. But we did have in the farm workers movement, we did have daycare for the kids. We had a Montessori school, and we had people that did help us. And, and you know, my oldest son is a doctor. My second son is Emilio, Emilio Huerta, is in a public interest attorney who's now running for Congress in the 21st Congressional District in California. And I have a daughter who's a nurse. Uh, Juanita, my daughter, be became a teacher. And so they, they became very resourceful. So, But I do want to encourage women out there, don't leave your kids behind. And grandmothers, bring your grandchildren, bring them to the marches, bring them to uh, the uh, protests that you have, because that way they really live these experiences and it makes them strong. And they feel the collective energy of, of people uh, who are trying to, uh, to fight for justice. So, you know, bring, bring them along. It's very important, as I did mine. Can you talk about uh, taking on, for example, the Texas Board of Education that would uh, perhaps like to wipe out references to Cesar Chavez, to Dolores Huerta? Talk specifically about that and what has been done to try to fight back against that, to tell the story of the farm workers in this country and help they help build the United States. Well, that that is a really, really big issue, uh, because by taking out the stories of the contributions of, of Latinos, of African Americans— Talk specifically about what they're trying to do. Well, not only in Texas, but in Arizona, they're trying to really remove the history of the contributions of people like myself. And, you know, and, and if we— Arizona, a judge just ruled against uh, uh, the the attack on ethnic studies right and and we know that, that they're trying to do this and, and actually when you, when you think about it and in our school books we don't talk about the contribution of people from Mexico you know tilling the lands building the railroads or people from Asia or indigenous uh, the indigenous uh, Native Americans in our country that were the first slaves or that the African slaves are the ones that built the White House and the Congress. And as long as we keep all of this uh, history out of our school books, then that really adds to the racism and the bigotry that we're seeing right now in our country. So I, I really encourage people to, you know, run for school board, get on those school boards. We've got to get labor studies, ethnic studies, women's studies, LGBT studies into our history books. And it's got to start at the kindergarten level, because now we see that racism is reared its ugly head, but it's very, very visible. They've taken off the, off the hoods, you know. But uh, and this is something that we, as people of color, have always suffered in this country. But now we know that we have to do something about it, because it is the cancer, and it's destroying our society. When you talk about uh, the alt-right, the white supremacists, the Klan, the neo-Nazis taking off mm -hmm. their hoods, mm -hmm. perhaps there was nothing more chilling. Um, some might have said, well, seeing people in hoods that represent the Ku Klux Klan. But the fact that they felt comfortable enough to not wear those hoods, to not cover their faces, and yet march with their torches in Nazi-like fashion and say, you will not replace us. And I think that's what the president, Donald Trump, has done. He has given people license uh, to express the racism. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing right now. And then we see the, what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, when you actually saw a Heather, uh, a white uh, person, and the two de uh, white deputies that were also killed, uh, you know, during that demonstration. So I think that 
I think this is a wake-up call for all of the United States of America, that all of us have got to step up in private organizations and public organizations, that we've got to start addressing the issue of racism and misogyny uh, against women. And again, you know, with, with what Trump is doing with the transgender ban in the mil military, this also hypes up the whole uh, homophobia that we have in our country. So uh, this is like, to me, this is a call to action. A where call would, to action for everybody. Where was your mother and father born? Uh, in the United States. Uh, my grandparents were actually born in the United States. I'm a fifth-generation American. My great-grandfather was in the Civil War on the Union side. And that's one of the things that we bring out uh, in, in the film Dolores, is even though, you know, I still have had trouble as a, as a teenager uh, to being treated like a United States citizen of this country, just because I happen to be Latina. You, in a few years, you're 87. We'll be 90 years old. Mm -hmm. What are your plans now? What are the projects you are taking on? Well, with our foundation, we continue our grassroots organizing because, you know, Amy, it's almost like a magic that, that we can, you know, raise money, hire an organizer, we send them into a community, they bring people together, they organize them through these house meetings, we build a base, and then they take on the issues in their community, and then they have to volunteer to do the work. And in volunteering, uh, this is how we create the kind of leadership. So you leave something behind everywhere that you go, everywhere that you organize, and then we encourage people to run. Many of the residents, that, and these are people that are ordinary people, they don't have a high school diploma, they don't have a college diploma, but they're serving on city councils, and they're serving on school boards, and recreation boards and utility districts. You know, we encourage them to run for office. And once they learn how to organize, they know how to get themselves elected. We're a C3, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, but we also do have a C4 where we can endorse candidates. And we do the civic engagement of, you know, making sure people register to vote, making sure that they get out to vote, uh, so that they realize that they have the power at the local level. And once they have that power, they have to act on it. And uh, this is how we are able to really take control uh, of our country. Finally, um, what gives you hope? You were deeply involved in the presidential campaign. Ultimately, while President Trump lost the popular vote by millions, mm -hmm. he did win. He became the 45th president of the United States. All of these issues you talk about, that you care about, each one very much under attack, what gives you hope? Well, as, I, as, as an organizer, I always uh, see things that are negative, like the presidency right now, as an organizing opportunity. Because I really think, as I said, it's a wake-up call, and people that were kind of out to lunch during the elections, or people that, for some reason or the other, decided not to vote, that now they realize that we've all got to take action. It's up to every single one of us. And there's a line uh, in, in the film, Dolores, by Robert Kennedy, where he's, just before he got killed, you know, he said, we have a responsibility to our fellow citizens. And this is what I hope that people will take from the film. All of us have a responsibility that we've got to engage, and we've got to you know, make sacrifices to make sure that we have a progressive people that are elected to office. You were at the Ambassador Hotel mm -hmm. when Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June of uh, 1968? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I was there with him. Where were you at the time he was gunned down? Well, just before he, uh, he was assassinated, I had been next to Robert Kennedy at the podium, and we had done, been out there doing the work, to, you know, uh, for his primary election uh, to make sure that he won. And uh, then, as we were stepping down from the podium, then they took him uh, back to the kitchen uh, of that ambassador hotel where he was assassinated. So you were still in the big room, yes. in the ballroom. Yes. I, well, I was right behind him actually, and uh, you know, just uh, as we got to the doorway, somebody pulled me aside, and so I wasn't able to go with him uh, through the doorway. Did you hear the bullet? Oh yes, I was. I was just right behind him, and we heard. Uh, I thought they were firecrackers. I thought they were a celebration because you heard all of these. I think about eight, eight. Shots, which I thought were firecrackers. Because he'd won the California he'd, yeah, primary. Yeah, he won the California primary. But then people started screaming, and we realized that they were bullets. And so, what happened then? What was your response? Where did you go? What was the scene in the ballroom? Well, uh, of course, there was chaos in the ballroom, and there was chaos. And uh, we did a vigil uh, when he was in the hospital, and then, of course, he passed away. Uh, you know, during 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 that vigil. Well, I guess um, if someone asked you then what gave you hope after the man you had championed had been assassinated right before you? Well, we know that uh, when you're working for the poorest people of all, 
and uh, the work that we have to do, there's only one way to go. You can't go down. You've got to keep going up, and you've got to keep working. And when we think of all of our martyrs, you know, when we think of Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Did you spend Malcolm any X, time with Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X? Actually, I didn't. I, I didn't. Uh, I was supposed to be with uh, uh, Martin Luther King in, in here in New York City, but somehow uh, the, the flight got canceled. I wasn't able to make it. And, but I did spend a lot of time with Coretta when she was uh, campaigning for the, for the holiday. But I think with all of these martyrs, the way that we for honor the them— the Martin Luther King holiday. Yeah. But the way that we honor our martyrs is that we have to continue doing the work. You know, we have to continue doing the organizing work and social justice work. And, you know, I've been quoting uh, uh, Pablo Neruda, the poet, uh, where he says, they can cut all the flowers, but you can't hold back the spring. And I think, like, back in the 60s, you know, when we were fighting Nixon, we had the Vietnam War, and uh, all of these organizations were just being formed in, the Green Movement, the LGBT Movement, the Second Wave of the Women's Movement, the uh, Civil Rights Movement, and we came out stronger. We came out stronger, and we changed policies, and I think that will happen again. Dolores, you were deeply involved with the campaign supporting Hillary Clinton. Upon reflection, do you see mistakes that were made? What do you learn, as you learn from every campaign you're involved with? And what do you think of how Bernie Sanders conducted his campaign? And do you think if he had been—he wasn't your choice of candidate, but if he had been the candidate, he could have beaten Donald Trump? Well, I think we, we won't know that, right? I mean, everybody thought that Hillary, Hillary was going to win. Uh, I don't think that the media was fair to, to Hillary. I think uh, Bernie could have been more supportive of Hillary, uh, you know, just before the general election, after she won the primary. So He you might know, have said the same in the lead-up to the um, convention, that he wished that uh, her, that the Democratic National Con Committee was more supportive of him as, a, as an equal candidate. Yeah, and, and we can kind of look backward, but I think at this point that we just have to look forward. But I think one of the issues that we do have, I think, with the Democratic Party is that we've got to make sure that, and I know that there's some kind of issues right now between whether they're going to support conservative candidates or progressive candidates, and I think all of us have to push the Democratic Party to say we've got to have progressive candidates. We don't need Republican light. We don't need to elect people to, uh, to the Congress or to the Senate that are going to vote with the Republicans. We're at a critical point in our country right now, and we've got to get the strongest, the most progressive candidates elected. So I'm also encouraging people, get involved in your local Democratic Party. You know, these are Democratic organizations. You've got to get in there and make sure that we get Democratic, uh, good uh, progressive candidates in our party, or in the Green Party, or even in the Republican Party. You mentioned that your son is running for Congress. Did you ever think of running for elected office? No, I, I consider myself an organizer, and I, you know, I, th I like to be able to work for progressive candidates and also to take the other ones out if they're not doing the job. Final thoughts, as you reflect on your life, certainly, as you travel the country with the film Dolores being released, people are talking to you about your legacy, though you are still extremely active and moving forward, um, as you reflect on your life. Well, I think I have a few years left, and hopefully that I can continue doing that grassroots organizing, which I believe is really vital, the way that we organize the Farm Workers Union, the way that we're organizing today uh, to get people involved and to really make people understand that they've got the power. But they've, they've, they've got to use that power. They've got to get engaged. None of us can afford to, uh, to take any time out right now. We are in a crisis. and. Uh, this is, and I hope that all uh, organizations get the kind of support that they need, not only uh, in terms of resources, but also in terms of volunteers that can help us go forward. Dolores Huerta, thanks so much for being with us. Dolores Huerta, the civil rights icon, the co-founder of the United Farm Workers of America with Cesar Chavez, president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation for Community Organizing. Her remarkable life is the subject of a new documentary. It's called Dolores. The film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year and is opening in theaters all over the country today on September 1st from PBS Distribution. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.